So my name is Kelsey Byers. I'm a group leader here at the John Innes Center. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what a group leader is, it's kind of like a lecture at universities. So I have my own research group. I don't do as much teaching, but I lead a research group and I manage a um, set of people who do research underneath me in a program that I've decided, which is really awesome. So essentially, uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm actually from the States originally. I came to the UK via Switzerland, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So what do I study? That's often the first question that people ask. So I work on floral trait evolution. So I try to understand how different traits, like the color of flowers, like the ones behind us, or the scent of flowers, or their shape, affect pollinator behavior. So bees and butterflies and so on and how that affects the evolution of flowering plants and their diversity on the planet. So in terms of floral traits, I mostly focus on floral scents. We've actually known for thousands of years as a species that flowers have smell and that insects can smell them. So Aristotle actually wrote about this in one of his books. But for centuries, we forgot about the fact that plants smell. And a large part of that is because smell is really hard to study. So it's easy for strongly scented flowers like roses. You can bury your nose in them and you can say, yeah, this totally smells. But many flowers are scented very weakly and so only insects can smell them. So I actually work on flowers that are more like that. So we use advanced techniques such as gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, which is basically a way of measuring scent samples in order to figure out what's actually in a plant's scent. We use techniques like electrophysiology, which is a fancy way of saying measuring the neural signals in an insect's antenna to figure out what they're actually smelling. And then we use behavioral techniques. So for example, letting bees fly around in an arena that has different flowers in it to see whether those scents actually matter to the pollinators. So that's one set of studies. After we've figured out what scents are actually important, we try to understand how they're produced by the flower. So for example, what are the genetic changes that underlie differences in scent between different species? And how are those differences in scent actually regulated, not just how are they produced? So we know in some species, for example, that scent is important for evolutionary differences between species, and also in understanding how new species come to be, a process that's called speciation. So I've shown, for example, in one group of plants called monkey flowers that are native to the United States, that scent is actually really important in keeping species apart. So my research here at JIC has just started, but I'm going to be working on a combination of different plant species. So I mentioned monkey flowers. I am also going to be working on orchids. So some orchid species that are native to the UK and some that are native to the Alps. And also bed straws, which are a sticky plant that you might have run into in hedgerows that are also native to the UK. So a little bit about my background. I was born in the United States. I grew up between California and Boston. When I was in Boston, I actually went to a special secondary school called what we would call here a technical college. I was in the same school as students who were learning how to bake and students who were learning how to repair cars, but I was actually learning biotechnology. So a lot of students from my school actually weren't expected to go to university. And I was told by the local school system no, you don't want to go to the technical college because you're smart and, you know, it's not for you. And I actually found the technical college was a better place for me because I learned a lot of really useful skills and it prepared me very well for university. So I went to university actually at the same university that my parents worked at. So I got a bit of a tuition break because you probably have heard tuition is very expensive in the United States. And then I worked for a year as a researcher in a lab that studied genetics. And that's when I discovered I did not want to study genetics for the rest of my life. I realized that I missed looking out the window. I'd see trees and I'd go like, why are there trees? I don't want to just focus on a single gene my entire career. So I started working in organismal biology and I had the choice when I started my PhD program, did I want to work in mice? Did I want to work in flowers? And I decided to work on flowers and that was the best choice I could have possibly made for me. So it was great. I did my PhD in Seattle on the west coast of the US, and that's a six year PhD program because in the US we often don't do a master's in biology. After that, I moved to Switzerland to do a postdoctoral program where I worked on orchids in the Alps. And then I moved to Cambridge to study butterflies, tropical butterflies called Heliconius for another postdoc. And then I moved to the John Innes Center. So I've always wanted to be a scientist. I know this is kind of a, a slam dunk question, 
but my parents, two of my parents are actually academic research scientists. They study the solar wind, which is the stream of charged particles that come from the sun, which is not the same as biology, obviously. But I knew that academia was an environment where I could be happy. And so I decided to work in academic biology. I originally wanted to be a veterinarian when I was a very small child, but then I realized I was afraid of blood. And the idea of hurting another animal, even if it was for their own benefit, made me kind of queasy. So then I decided I wanted to be a zoologist and study animals. Then I decided I wanted to be a geneticist. And now I'm an organismal biologist, geneticist sort of mix. So that's basically what I do and where I'm from. So what do I like about science? I think my favorite thing about science is that I've got a passion for curiosity-driven research. So I am the kind of person this afternoon, for example, I was going from the lunchroom back to my office and I saw the marigolds that are planted by the reception. And I said, you know, those smell really wonderful. And I've heard that marigolds are really good for beneficial planting because they repel pests. So why is that, right? So that sort of question-driven science is what I really love. The fact that I can pursue that kind of research based on ideas I have, I think is really great. From a day-to-day -day point of view as a group leader, I do a lot of different things. So I do lab administrative stuff, which is not very exciting. So things like ordering supplies and hiring folks. The more exciting stuff is when I get to get my hands dirty and mess with the science. I also write up research that's done by myself and collaborators. And I have to apply for grant funding from the UK government. So it's sort of a mixture of lots of different things. It depends, what you do depends on what stage in your research career you're in. So I actually like what I do quite a lot because I do lots of different things. So I have the choice to say, okay, how do I feel right now? Do I want to write? Do I want to get messy in the lab? Do I want to sit and read papers? And I can decide based on how my schedule works and what I feel like doing, which I think is really good. It's very flexible. So I wanted to briefly talk a little bit about disability. As you can probably see from the shot, I'm actually using a wheelchair. So I have a genetic disease that means that I use a wheelchair sometimes and I walk other times. And I want to say this isn't a barrier to me contributing to science and participating in science, and it shouldn't be a barrier for anyone else either. So I still do field work, as long as it's not really strenuous field work. So I can work in the Alps, for example, where we can drive up to a field site, and then I can do some walking around, look at my orchids, collect pollinators with a net. I can't do a lot of really strenuous work. I can't climb cliffs or repel down glaciers. But when it comes to being able to contribute to science, I can do basically anything that anyone else can. And I think that's really important to remember. Even if you have a chronic medical condition, you have a learning disability, you have another disability, you can do anything that someone else can do, especially in science. The fact that it's flexible and lets you really work primarily with your mind, I think lets you do a lot of things that you might not be able to do in other positions.